Hey guys, we're back for part two of our Pearl Harbor lesson. When we left off, Pearl Harbor had been blown up. And what we're going to look at is two gentlemen that were um, what I consider to be pretty important men during this war. The first one is Mitsu Fushida, and he was the guy that had the battle cry for the attack. Uh, he had talked about how incredible it was when he woke up at three o'clock in the morning, Hawaii time. He had just turned about four days before 39 years old. He had been looking for something really significant in his military career to do. And he had really worked hard to become one of the most decorated naval pilots. So he was pretty excited that he was the one called. There were six aircraft carriers that were positioned about 230 miles north of Oahu Island. He was the general commander, and so it was his job to do kind of all the last minute checks. So he checked the intelligence information reports. He um, made sure that his plane, which was a um, single engine, three seater, 97 type Japanese plane, and it was used for level bombing and torpedo flying. So he was pretty excited. He knew that his objective was just to surprise and cripple um, the American naval forces at Pearl Harbor. His biggest concern, obviously, was the U.S. battleships not being there. So he hadn't really given much thought of the, possi the possibility of um, his attack actually breaking open a mortal confrontation with the United States. But his only concern really was about making military success for himself and for his country. So as he began to do this, this is what was considered his eyewitness account. He recalls this from a, um, or we get it actually from a diary that he had had. And it says veering right toward the West coast of the Island. We could see that the sky over Pearl Harbor was clearly presently the harbor uh, clear. Presently, the harbor itself became visible across the central Oahu Plain, a film of morning mist hovering over it. I peered intently through my binoculars at the ships riding peacefully at anchor. One by one, I counted them. Yes, the battleships were there, all right, eight of them. But our last lingering hope to find any carriers present was now gone. Not one was to be seen. So, this was um, an exciting moment for him. He was the one that yelled Tora, 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 which means tiger, 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 which is actually just the battle cry for attacking Pearl Harbor and was very excited, obviously, about the ships that were there. But some of our battleships um, or our carriers weren't there, which means we did have some fighting power out at sea. So, he had talked about how this was his most thrilling exploit of his career. He had dreamed pretty much his whole life of becoming an admiral like Admiral Togo, who was their commander in chief in this decisive battle of the J uh, Japan Sea. And he said he was determined to prove on his Pearl Harbor feet even after this. So he saw action in many other battles but it kind of came to a screeching halt because he never could match the feelings he got when he um, attacked Pearl Harbor. So just before the Battle of Midway, he came down with appendicitis and ended up not being able to fly. So for that, you know, for quite a bit of time, things after that just got worse for him. He did not want Japan to surrender when it was time. He said he would rather have fought till the last man was standing. However, when um, the emperor uh, had decided that he was going to surrender, obviously this guy had had to reluctantly do what he was told because you know we had talked about Emperor Hirohito and how he actually felt for his people and after the bombings, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he couldn't take it anymore and wanted his people to be free. In the meantime, there was a guy named Jacob DeShazer. Now, Jacob was in the American military. He um, 
was a sergeant, was on KP duty peeling potatoes at a U.S. Army base in Oregon when news of the attack on Pearl Harbor came. The Japanese came over the loudspeaker. DeShazer became enraged. He threw a potato against the wall and shouted. Well, that's because he was doing KP duty, which was kitchen duty. And the Japs are going to have to pay for this. Remember, Japs is not a nice term, so we don't ever use that. At that moment, intense hatred for the Japanese was born in young Jacob DeShazer's heart. And it grew with every passing day. So this is kind of what was happening. He began, uh, began to make plans to personally provide payback to the Japanese. He volunteered to go on a secret bombing mission. Okay, So his plane ends up going down and he becomes a prisoner of war. And this is where the story really begins because Jacob DeShazer one month later, volunteers to go on a special um, raid that was out there with the Doolittle Squadron. This was a surprise raid on Tokyo from the Carrier Hornet. On April 18th, 1942, he was one of the bombarders and was filled with elation at getting his revenge on the Japanese. Unfortunately, after the bombing raid, they flew on towards China, but ran out of fuel and were forced to parachute into Japanese-held territory. And then the plane got shot down. So the next morning, DeShazer found himself a prisoner of Japan. He spent 40 months in captivity, 34 months of it in solitary confinement, which means that he was in there all alone with no one to talk to, which can actually drive somebody insane. Um, he was a victim of cruel torture and starvation. It really was a brutal situation that he was put into. Jacob was a prisoner of war. He was held and tortured for many years before he was finally released um, years later. So in prison, Jacob's hatred grew. It really kind of began to consume him, okay? In his words, he said, my hatred for the enemy nearly drove me crazy. My thoughts turned to what I had heard about Christianity changing hatred between human beings into real brotherly love. And I was gripped with a strange longing to examine the children's, uh, the Christian's Bible to see if it could, if I could find the secret. So Jacob is in prison. While in prison, he was exposed to death by firing squad. He had people that were starved to death. Um, there was, out of one of his books, he had talked about one of the officers, Jacob Meter, who was a strong Christian, and he actually dies of starvation. But he tells Jacob why he has peace while he's going through it and how, you know, he was able to find freedom through Jesus Christ. So Jacob kind of begins to think about that. And of course, he asks for a Bible. So he starts to think about hatred between members of the human race. I wonder what it was that made the Japanese hate the Americans and what made me hate the Japanese. So his thoughts turned toward what he had heard about Christianity, like I said a minute ago, changing hatred between humans into real brotherly love. And he begged his captors for a Bible and was given one for three weeks. So a little bit more background on that. It about May 1944, a, gr a guard had brought him a Bible, but told him that he could only have it for those three weeks. So he began to read its pages, chapter by chapter. And he was actually very fascinated with um, reading the Old Testament prophets. Six times he had read through their writings, but he focused mostly on the mention of a divine redeemer to come, you know, one born in human flesh. And then he went to the New Testament, and when he got there, he found out that there was the fulfillment of these prophecies in the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this truly changed everything for him. He read in Romans, and I'm going to read that from the Bible, in 10.9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, You'll be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth you, you confess and are saved. Well, believe it or not, that's exactly what he did. Even though he remained in prison for more than a year after this, he was freed 
from hatred, free to love. So it makes you ask, can true peace and forgiveness be found in the midst of so much hatred and pain? So here you have Mr. Fushida, who all he ever wanted to do was kill the Americans and then try to figure out ways to top that moment. And you have D Jacob DeShazer, who is being brutalized, you know, tortured in prison by the Japanese and hates them more than anything, but is starting to realize that that's not the way it should be as he reads the Bible. It's interesting that at this time, even though he was still in prison, he was able to free his mind. He was treated really badly um, by a particular guard one day, Jacob was, and he decided the next day he was gonna treat him with kindness and said hello in Japanese. And it, um, a thing I was reading said that he kept doing it. And after a week, the guy started actually bringing him extra food. So it does make you wonder, does the kindness go a long way. And it does. We know that. When we treat people with respect and kindness, it goes a long way. So Jacob told it like this. I discovered that God had given me new spiritual eyes when I looked at the Japanese officers and guards who had starved and beaten me and my companions so cruelly. I found my bitter hatred for them changing to loving pity. I realized they did not know anything about my Savior and that if Christ is not in a heart, it's natural to be cruel. So he started to realize, hey, these people are doing this, but they don't know Jesus, so they don't know any better in his mind. Meanwhile, Fushida is struggling pretty badly. With the end of the war, his military career was over. So he said, since all Japanese forces were disbanded, I returned to my home village near Osaka and began farming. But it was a discouraging life. I became more and more unhappy, especially with the war crime trials open in Tokyo. Though I was never accused, General Douglas MacArthur summoned me to testify on several occasions. So that's what ended up happening with him. He never could meet that need. Well, it goes on to say that as he got off of the train one day in Tokyo's Shibayan station, he, I saw an American distributing literature. When I passed him, he handed me a pamphlet entitled, I Was a Prisoner of Japan, involved right then with the trials and atrocities committed against war prisoners. I took it. What I read was the fascinating episode which eventually changed my life. So it's interesting because he actually is sitting in a train station. He gets a flyer that Jacob DeShazer actually had written himself. He had written it when he had gotten out of prison. Jacob forgave the Japanese while he was being tortured in prison and actually made a promise that he would come back to Japan and he would serve those people. He would try to tell them about Christ and who Christ is, which to me is huge when you have a guy that was beaten and tortured the way he was. Then Mitsu Fushida receives that pamphlet while just sitting in a train station and finds peace because right after that, he goes and gets a Bible and actually reads through the Bible. Both of them now know the Lord and love the Lord. It was interesting because healing starts taking place in their hearts. Um, in the book, it had talked about how um, Fushida actually went to Jacob's house and told him he wanted to become a Christian and was baptized. How cool is that, that two men who had such bitter hatred for one another could turn their hearts toward Christ and love each other? So they both actually become missionaries, spreading the word of Christ. The two former enemies became friends, which to me is a testament of God's miraculous healing of hearts. See, when you look at the lives of these two men and the hatred they felt for one another's countries, it's hard to believe that, you know, forgiveness would be a part of their lives. Without God's forgiveness in our lives, you know we lack the capacity and desire to forgive others. Um, it says in the Bible, in many different places, that we need to forgive. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. That's in Matthew 18, 21. 22, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ for God forgave you, Ephesians 4, 32. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you, Matthew 6, 14. We can forgive because he 
first forgave us. With God as our guide, we can accomplish anything, including repairing our wounded hearts, Corinthians says in 1 Corinthians 13. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Guys, if you learn nothing else, love will conquer all. It took hatred that these two men had and turned it into peace and love. Can true peace and forgiveness be found in the midst of so much hate and pain? Without God's forgiveness in our lives, we lack the capacity and desire to forgive others. So the truth is, like it says in Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. So pretty cool story. That's one that I always enjoy sharing and I'm glad I was able to do it through video for you guys. I hope that um, you have learned something valuable. If nothing else, learn that hatred gets us nowhere, guys. Love truly will conquer all.